Well, it's so good to be back. You know, I've been, uh, once in a while I'll travel, do leadership conferences, and so I went all the way back to New Hampshire and uh, did a, a two-and-a-half-day leadership conference for all of the people in the Northeast area, came down, and then I went over to Indiana Wesleyan University and taught there for three days, a uh, doctoral uh, class, and uh, then some postdoctorate people came, and then I did the chapel, 3,000 students, and uh, taught them about how to read the Bible, how to journal, a novel idea for Bible college students, and uh, they were very receptive. And then a friend of mine who lives in Montana uh, owns some cattle, and so he said, if you ever want to just get away and just ride some horses, well, you just give me a call. So I was flying right by there. So I said, hey, I'll come and just spend three days. He said, oh, perfect, because we need help. I said, what's that? He said, oh, rounding up some cattle. And so I said, ah, no problem. What he didn't tell me is that he owns 200,000 acres. And the cattle is spread over all of the above. And to bring them down into a 10-mile or a 5-mile swath, they use helicopters to get them out of the area. He has 5,000 head of Angus cattle. Now, I don't know this. That, that was the hardest work I have ever done in my life. I arrived there, and we ride two horses a day because we wear out the horse half a day. So we bring a whole a string of horses at a certain camp we ride, we go into the hills, and when the cattle and their calves run, you've got to go after them and bring them in down into a draw, a ravine, and then bring them down. So you want to see some of that? Yeah. All right, so here it is. Now, this is just taken with my iPhone, but this is some uh, scenes uh, from just these last couple of days. And what you're going to see is me on my iPhone when it's settled down, it's calm. <laughs> Because uh, when we're going after cows, I got to put that in and go like a madman. So, uh, it's, so we wore out the, a horse in the morning and then get another one at night. And then when I'm done, first day, honest, I could not even get off my horse. <laughs> I was so sore. And my bottom has not forgiven me <laughs> since. So, but let's take a look at some of the easier moments of our cattle rustling here. Let's take a look. It's early in the morning, we've got a helicopter here. The ranch. Oops, well, okay, here we go. I don't know if you can hear all the cows back there, but there's about 5,000 head of cattle. And that will be punching. Well, not today, but man, if we can get. There's a bunch of horses. You can see them back on coming. There you go, you need the horses. Yeah. 
Pepper's going to mark. And there's Brian over there. There's Dennis. <laughs> there's a little bit. There you go. <laughs> oh, that was fun. Hey, we're going to continue to pray for the uh, same-sex bill to go down, so we never want to forget about that. Continue to call and email and bug your representative. Uh, if, even if they don't get back to you, they'll log a list that, that we got 1,000 calls or we got 1,500 emails. We have shut the email system down at the Capitol four times. Four times. And so, even though some, I was on uh, the Mike Buck show today, and uh, Don O'Brien's The Fish, and uh, as I was talking, one guy called in and said, you know, I've tried to get a hold of my representative. They never call you back. And I said to him, do not be discouraged, because they'll log those calls, and they'll say, we got so many calls and so many emails, and that says a lot to them. Now, we've got to inundate them with the voice of the people. If when it's all done and the bill uh, gets passed, and they didn't listen to us, it'll be a new day in politics, let me tell you, because uh, then I know they do not listen to the voice of the people. They're on a fixed rail. A fixed rail doesn't start in Kapolei. It starts at the Capitol, because sometimes stuff's already on a fixed rail, doesn't care what you say, I'm going to do this anyway. Then we need to get them out of office, vote them out, and it'll be a five, ten year run on this because we've got to change them over to new uh, leadership. And if God is laying on your heart or a Christian's heart or someone that is a good thinker that understands the lay of the land and, and is, is concerned about the future of the keiki no ka'aina and not just the here and now but the tomorrow and beyond, uh, and God is calling you to run for office, man, please do. I know Carol Ka'apu is running for office, and if we have a bunch more, yeah. And if we have a bunch more, please do. Let's do it, because we've got to change this over, because it is bad government. And laws that do not square with the law of God is an unjust law. If you recall, that was uh, spoken by Martin Luther King Jr. The laws of the land that do not square with God's law are unjust laws. So people say, well, Wayne, what, what do we do? If people ask us about this, what should we say? Let me give you four points. Are you ready? Number one, when they ask you about this and they say, oh, how come you guys are a bunch of homophobes? They say, okay, number one, Jesus Christ died for LGBT, gays, lesbians, transgender, bisexuals. That's what LGBT stands for. Jesus Christ died for them and anybody else. It does not matter what your past is. Jesus Christ died for you. You are loved, number one. Can we say amen to that? Yeah, don't start with any bad, bad, bad kind of thing. No, Jesus Christ died for those people. And they are under the blood of Christ that God wants them to be saved. However, number two, the second is, it is sin that separates man from God's love. And so we cannot endorse that which put Christ on the cross that he died to eradicate. He came to eradicate sin. And so we're not going to legislate into law something that has been destroying mankind and it will keep you out of the kingdom of God. It wouldn't be in our nature to do that. We can't. We just can't do that. We're Christians. We know what Jesus came to do. We cannot say, let's vote for something that legislates into law immorality that will destroy families and futures. No, we just can't do that. No, we love you just like you are, but God loves you too much to let you stay that way. God's going to make some changes in you. So no, we're not going to legislate that into law. Now, the reason why they want it into law so badly is because when it's the law, it's now legal. And 
deep in every single person's heart, and I said this on the show, deep in every person's heart as an, is an inherent sense that that lifestyle is not God's optimum lifestyle. It's deep in my heart. I know that. It's in my conscience. Because the Bible says that God has placed eternity in the heart of every man. Not just save people, every man. There's something inside when and a word of eternal worth is spoken, bang, it resounds in your heart because you know that's true. God has placed that in the heart of every man. He's given to every man a measure of faith. So it's there, that spark is in there. Well, if I can get this thing into law so it's legal, what it does is it sort of assuages my conscience and mitigates my conscience. It tones it down, it dumbs it down, it numbs it up a little so I don't have to feel so bad about it. So we need it into law so you don't bug me about it anymore because it's legal. Well, I'm sorry. It doesn't matter what the law says. It is still immoral and it's something that separates people from God. So, number one, Jesus Christ came and died for every gay person. And every heterosexual that is in fornication or any person that's in uh, to gossip or lying or drunkenness or carousing or drug addiction, the door is open to everyone, whosoever will may come and drink freely of the waters of life. So number one, God loves them. But number two, God doesn't love that sin. That's why he came. So then number three, they'll say, well, God, if God loves us, how come you guys hate us? Then I go back and say, no, no, let's define God's love. This is number three. God's love is defined as God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him would not perish but have everlasting life. God himself came. He didn't send this uh, assignment delegated to an angel. God said, this is so important. I am going to do it myself. You understand that? He didn't delegate it to uh, an angel. He didn't delegate it to an emissary. He said, I will come myself in the form of man, and that's a person of Christ. And Jesus Christ came, now this is the love of God, to eradicate sin from your life and mine in order that we might be redeemed. So you can't have it together, right? So he came to separate sin from us because sin was taking mankind away. There is a chasm. Well, God says, I don't want to just bridge the chasm and you bring in the sin. No, I've got to do this. Watch this. I've got to eradicate you from that sin and then bring you close. I couldn't bring you close, so I built a bridge to you, but it's not with that sin. That sin has to be on, uh, uh, taken care of, and that's where repentance comes in and forgiveness, and now we can come back to Christ and become one. But you cannot just bring the sin in. Well, how come you guys hate us? Oh, no, 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 we love you. Well, how come you just, you say that we can't do this thing? Well, remember, it's just like the love of a parent. If I see my son or my daughters carousing or doing something wrong, I say, you're not going to do that. You get home. No, we want to do such and such. No, you're not going to do that. Then you hate us. Oh, shut up. Get home. <laughs> That's immaturity speaking. You know how much I love you. And that's why I'm asking you to stop that kind of behavior. Why? Because I hate you? No, because I what? Love you. Get home. Come on. You understand that? And so sometimes the, the, the semantics of all of that is, is an, an immature heart just throwing a tantrum again and saying, you hate us. No, we love you. But you have to remember the love of God came to die for your sin that you might be free from it. God's love isn't permissiveness to say, well, if you want to do that, it's okay. And we'll even change the law so that you don't have to worry about your conscience bothering you. Well, that will doom them to hell forever. So, number one, God died for all of them. Jesus Christ died, bled and died for them. Number two, but number two is God came to make sure that sin will be answered. There's an answer to sin. And there's a redemption. There's a, there's a rectification uh, clause there. But three, God's love is not permissiveness. 
And just because God doesn't permit something, it doesn't mean he hates or people hate. Now, remember, watch this. If this is the sin and there's nothing else, all right, then what is the choice that you have? Just that. But now watch. I put up the truth here. Now what does it do? It gives you a what? A choice. Now, if this is someone who wants to do sin, then all of a sudden a choice comes up. People that want you to sin, gets, they get really mad at this choice. It's called truth. But they'll get mad at that. And the scripture says, you know why? Because their deeds are evil and they walk in darkness. And they don't want to walk in the truth. But we've got to hold that truth up. Just got to hold it up. Will they all accept it? No, because number four, if this does pass, and God forbid, but if this does pass into law, God's law is still the highest law in the land. That is still unlawful. It doesn't matter what man says. We must obey God rather than men. Well, it's the law now. It's man's law, not God's law. You have heard it say, you can go out and do and such and such, but may it not be so among you. You have heard it say, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, but it is not so among you. Why? Because you're a people of the kingdom of God. Okay, did you get those four? All right, so everybody, take out your Bible. <laughs> Pastor Rod, come up here with your Bible. With your Bible, not that demonic thing. Come on up here. <laughs> come on up here. All right. You want to lead us in this or you want me to lead it? You lead. <laughs> That's what I thought. Just checking. All right, everybody, hold up your Bible. Uh, ooh, there's more now. That's so cool. I love it. One of the things that... You can put it down for a second. Your hands are going to get tired. One of the things, Pastor Rod, that we want to do here at New Hope is let this next season be where we make the Bible, the Word of God, preeminent again. Because one of the things I've seen... In the legislature, and the Senate, there's people who are called Christians, but practically they live as atheists. They're practical atheists. They, they espouse Christianity, but they live like atheists. And they make decisions incorrectly. That's unbiblical. Why? Because the scripture says you err because you know not the scriptures nor the power of God. So we've got to get back to a Bible literacy program. And so we're going to start learning that. Everybody good on that? Yes. Make the Bible preeminent. And I'll tell you why in a second. Okay, here we go. Ready? Go. This is my Bible, the Word of God. And I boldly declare this is the highest law in the land. I am what it says I am. I have what it says I have. I do what it says I do. I am a citizen of heaven. Yeah. Hold on, hold on, hold on. We're not done. Let's all stand. Some of you were stuttering and stammering. We're going <clears> to... <throat> I'm watching with my makas. All right. Ready? Go. This is my Bible, the Word of God. And I boldly declare that this is the highest law in the land. I am what it says I am. I have what it says I have. I do what it says I do. I am a citizen of heaven. Yeah, give yourself a hand. Good job, everybody. Thank you, Pastor Rod. We are, <clears throat> he's so cute, you know that? <laughs> Your wife told me to say that to you, otherwise you feel inferior. So, <clears throat> You know, I'm, we're, we're reading through the book of Acts, and uh, I, I was reading through this uh, chapter, and Acts chapter 5, and, and I'll be talking about chap Acts chapter 6, but I was saying, God, I wish we lived back in the Bible times. I said, Lord, look at the miracles, the presence of the Holy Spirit, that people would come out and they'd be prayed for an instant healing. Oh, God. What has happened? I said, oh God, I wish we lived in Bible times. And bang, just then the Lord said, you can be. Because Bible times are any times in which the Bible is preeminent. That the word of God is the highest law in the land. 
that you live according to what you believe. And when I, the Bible says, the eyes of the Lord move to and fro throughout the earth looking for those whose hearts are set on him. And if you want Bible blessings, he said, you do it the Bible way. If you want a Bible marriage and with Bible blessings on your marriage, then you do it biblically. If you want Bible blessings on your relationships, then you do it biblically. And so we could have Bible times in this, this next decade. It could be just like the book of Acts if these are Bible times. And so as we return our hearts to the word of God and say, God, how do you say it? That's how we're going to live it. In Deuteronomy chapter 6, there's a grand uh, a declaration. Uh, there, there is a, a creed that comes to the people, and it's, uh, it's a shema. The word shema means to hear and do. It's, it doesn't mean just hear. It means you, I presuppose that you, because you heard it, it's going to change your life. Shema Israel, Yahweh Elohenu, Yahweh Echad. It's, what, it, what it is is, hear, O Israel, the Lord your God is one God. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And the word that I am speaking to you today shall be on your mind. It shall be on your heart and it shall be on your hands. And did you know that even today, if you go to Israel, they will take Deuteronomy chapter 6, and you can see how literal they are, but they'll write on this little piece of paper, the Shema of Israel, Yahweh Elohim, Yahweh Echad, and, and it'll continue to, to get those few verses. They'll roll it up in a miniature scroll, put it in a little box about this big, stick it on their head, and they'll wrap it around their head when they pray. So it's like this, uh, this tumor coming out of the front of their lobe here. And, but basically, it is that scripture because it says, the word I speak to you will be on your forehead. And it'll be on your arm. They have a box on their arm, and it's called a tefillin. And they wrap it around their arm with straps. And when they pray, they actually, you'll see it. They'll have a black box here and a black box here. And they'll be praying. Uh, they'll speak the word. They'll pray it out. Baruch Adonai Eloheinu Melech HaOlam. And they'll just continue to pray in Hebrew. And uh, that just meant, blessed be the Lord, our God, the creator of the universe. So they'll pray their prayers in Hebrew. But you'll wonder, what is that box on their head? It's like right here, a little box. And a little box over here. They take it literally, and uh, they take the scripture, and they put it in a box on their hand and their forehead. And they wrap something on their heart, and that's how they pray. But God didn't say, put a piece of scripture on your forehead. What he was saying is, what I speak to you, make sure it influences everything you think. That the word of God is so preeminent that everything I think has to be filtered through the word of God. And when it's on my hand, it means that the word of God should influence everything we and everything we feel. You understand? And that's how he says, then you're understanding what it means to love the Lord your God with all your heart with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. So what, when he says that, the greatest law in the New Testament, he says, you want to know the greatest law of all? There it is. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, all your strength. It goes back to Deuteronomy chapter 6. And what he's saying is the way to love the Lord your God is the scripture, the word of God... Uh, that the way to love the Lord is the word of God has to influence every thought I think, every act I do, every principle I believe, and everything that I feel has to be inundated with the word of God. And if we as God's people choose and commit ourselves to this next era in New Hope Oahu to make the word of God preeminent in our lives, regardless of what Caesar does, regardless of what the world does, we are citizens of heaven. Placed here on this spinning globe for a little while. And then... Don't forget who you are. Okay, here we go. <laughs> Don't forget, influence people now. You are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world. Don't put your light under a peck measure, but make sure it's on the top of a table 
so that all can see. A few more spins, you're done. And he put us on this spinning earth. Think about how quickly the last 10 years have gone by. Has it gone by quickly? That's how fast, if not faster, your next 10 years are going to go by. And God is saying, one day you're going to be at the end and you're going to turn around and say, the world spun so quickly. And the question is, did you let your light shine? Were you the people that I asked you to be on that spinning globe? Because you see, some people are caught on that spinning globe and the culture of the world is ruled by the prince and the power of the air. And as I said before, I really don't think, and I still have to study this theologically, but I really don't think Lucifer has ever been to hell. He was cast out of heaven to where? And you look at Revelation, it says, when will he be bound and cast into outer darkness and to the eternal lake of fire? In the end times. But right now, he will be the prince and the power of this age right here. So he, what he wants to do people into thinking that this is a better substitute than heaven. You don't need heaven because if you do what I tell you, you I, you remember Luke 4? He showed Jesus all the kingdoms and all its glory and he says, if you will bow down and worship me, I will give you all of this for it has been given to me to give to whomever I wish. So we get duped into that, get hooked in, and so we say, you know, I'd rather be here and do my thing, and you guys don't bother me because I don't believe that there's something like a hereafter. This is my heaven. And the devil says, yes, this is it. And even Christians are trading in their passports to heaven to be a to be a citizen of this world. And they just use God to bless me more in this world. Give me more on this world so that I've got more peaches and cream in this world. And Jesus said, I didn't come to give you more peaches and cream in this world because this world is not your home. This is your assignment. I will provide for you what you need and even more abundantly. But don't forget who you are. And as we're spinning, that's why he stops it every once in a while. Er, don't forget who you are. He puts us back. And that's why times like this are so important for me to just stand here with you and say, er, don't forget who you are. Otherwise, we'll espouse Christianity but live as practical atheists. And that dichotomy is what's causing confusion in the world, not the gospel. It's the inconsistent presentations of the gospel that confuse people. And so God has an assignment. And he says, now, by the way, uh, <clears throat> there's a bunch of people caught up in this world. They've been trapped. But the truth will set them... Not to define freedom as what I can do now. No, freedom is what you don't have to be trapped by anymore. Yeah, I'm going to set you free from the, the talons of this earth that keeps you there. Woo! Yep, I'm going to set you free by the truth. Well, all I know, I just grew up with this. Now you got this. Make a wise choice. <gasps> Some people say, well, I want you to get rid of that truth so I can go back to my just doing stuff the way I want to do it. And, and we want laws to endorse that. Oh, there's a truth. We hate that. Oh, sorry. We're going to punch you. We're going to persecute you. Sorry. I, it's, I was a, I'm now a, a poster child for the ACLU. I heard on their blog, they're splattering my name all over and this and that and and I was getting a little tired the other day of just being a, you know, a target for all of these people. And, and uh, I was saying, oh, God, what do I do? And the Lord said, rejoice. I said, rejoice? I ain't rejoicing. This is stupid. He said, rejoice. You finally made it. I said, made it into what? Into the, prof the realm of the prophets. 
I said, what? See, Matthew 5.10. Turn to Matthew 5.10. Listen to this. This is crazy cool. <laughs> Matthew 5.10. I came across this and he says, Blessed are you when you've been persecuted for the sake of righteousness. For yours is the kingdom of heaven. Rejoice. Blessed are you when men cast insults at you and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely. On account of me. Rejoice, there it is, and be glad, for your reward in heaven is great, for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. He said, You finally made it into the realm of the prophets. <laughs> it took me 61 years to get there. See, don't be afraid when people say, get that truth down. I can't. It's like those guys on Iwo Jima. No way. Zzz, zzz, whistle of bullets are whizzing by, and we just hold that up. Why? Because if we let this drop, what choice has the world? You understand how important that assignment is? Well, you're going to get nailed. Well, but if we drop it because we, want, we don't want reprisals, then what choice does the world have? The church is the hope of the world. The truth that lies within us is the hope of the world, people. They have no other hope. So if our light goes out, how are they going to find their way home? The church is the hope of the world. And if we live incongruently, and if we're afraid of reprisal, so we just sort of shift over and say, okay, we love you, just go ahead and do what you want to do because we want to be nice to you. That's nice, and they like you, but they're in eternal trouble. That truth that lies within you is the hope of the world. And for many people, you are the only Jesus they will ever see. And you are the only Bible they will ever read. You. That's why it's so incredibly important for us to say, this is my Bible, the Word of God. And I boldly declare that this is the highest law in the land. I am what it says I am. I have what it says I have. I do what it says I do. I am a citizen of heaven. Don't forget who you are. Amen, amen, amen. 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 Well, turn in your Bibles to the book of Acts, Acts chapter 6, because these are Bible times. Tomorrow you're going to be in Acts chapter 6. Today you were in Acts chapter 5. Today, uh, tomorrow Acts 6. Now, let me go through a little bit about, uh, of this and uh, we will see sort of how new hope is going to be patterned. If we pattern our church after any church, I don't want it to be a Saddleback church or Willow Creek church or any other mega churches. I want it to be patterned after the church in the book of Acts. Isn't that right? And so as I'm reading through this, I thought, you know what? We need to get back to this, where the Bible is preeminent. Jesus Christ is uh, Lord and King of Kings. And everything that the Bible has, we have. What the Bible says, we do. And so I looked at this, and it says this. Now, at this time, while the disciples were increasing in number, a complaint arose on part of the Hellenistic, which is Grecian, or the Greeks, Hellenistic Jews against the native Hebrews. There's some people that were born Jews in the Grecian Macedonian area. They then come into Jerusalem. They're Jews, but they're Grecian or Hellenistic uh, Jews. Remember Helen of Troy? So that's on the coast where Turkey is now. So the Hellenistic Jews are those Jews that have grown up in Asia Minor or the area of Greece, which is now, uh, well, not Greece, but Asia Minor is Turkey. So now, the day of the Passover is coming. All of these people are coming down 
over here to Jerusalem, and these are Hellenistic Jews. The, the, the other Jews are Hebrew Jews. Okay, so now they're here. A lot of people have come. A bunch of them get saved. If you recall in the book of Acts, we find 5,000 will get saved, 3,000 at a time. So they come for the Passover. They get saved. Now, they're going to stay to get discipled. Now, if you've got 5,000 people here extra in New Hope, and they live like in um, Australia, and we're going to ask them to stay on a few days so we can disciple all of these new believers, you've got to provide like food for them and housing for them because all of the inns in Jerusalem are going to be full. So the church has to provide. So they were gathering food and money. People were selling their land. And you just read about Ananias and Sapphira who sold their land and said, whoo, and they kept a bunch of it and said, whoo, this is everything we got for the land. We're giving everything we got to the church. And when the apostles came and said, well, you know, hey, you could have just said this is 25%. Why do you lie to the Holy Spirit and say this is 100% to get the accolades of the people? Why? And there was a discipline that took place because of that. Make sure you read Acts 5 and you'll see what's happening. All these people that have traveled all the way from Turkey now are getting saved in Jerusalem. And now they're saying, hey, we got to travel all the way back. But if we're going to be go through your growing deep, growing strong course here and... Uh, <laughs> Because you guys just talk so long, it's going to take three days to go through the course. Well, we got to have breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Well, what was happening was, because it was growing so fast, a complaint arose on the part of those Hellenistic Jews against the native Hebrews. Why? Because their widows were being overlooked in the daily serving of food. There was a food line, a chow line. And certain people were being overlooked in the daily serving of food. Now, is that a problem? Oh, yeah, especially if they were like local women from Hawaii, let's say, that are being overlooked. And we would rise. There'd be a riot, man. You don't, you don't overlook us in food. <laughs> well, there was a real cause for dissension. Now, the 12 summoned the congregation. Hey, everybody, let's get together. Let's have a meeting. Uh, the, the apostle said, you know, for us to, to just go and serve tables and, and get the food ready and stuff, uh, boy, it won't be desirable for us to neglect the word of God in order to serve tables. Although that's important because that's a reasonable complaint that they're being overlooked in the daily serving of food. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to raise up new leaders Select from among yourselves, brethren, seven men with three qualifications. Number one, of good reputation. Two, full of the Holy Spirit. Three, wisdom that we will put in charge of the task. And they chose seven. Well, the statement found approval with the whole congregation. They chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit. Philip, Procurus, Nicanor, Timon, T, uh, Parmenas, and Nicholas, a proselyte from Antioch. And they, they brought these before the apostles, and after praying, they laid their hands on them. Now the result, listen to this. The word of God kept on spreading. And the number of the disciples continued to increase greatly in Jerusalem. And many of the priests, who were like Pharisees and high priests, uh, were becoming obedient to the faith. They were actually leaving their stodgy old ways and getting saved. You understand what's happening? One of the things that happens when, uh, the first thing that happens when there is a move of the Spirit, increased disciples, increased numbers, the first result when the Spirit of God begins to move is what? Problems. That's problems. You come to Christ and you really want to serve God, watch how you're going to have marriage problems if your husband or your spouse does not love Jesus. What do you want? You want to church again? You live down there? 
Do they put food on your table? What are you doing giving money to the church? They don't do nothing for you. Don't you be giving my check to the church? Yeah, you see, when the Spirit of God begins to move, one of the very first results is going to be trouble. Why, you say, why? God, why is it so hard? Think about it this way. Here's a house. You live there alone. You're a bachelor, all right? Sick talking to the men here. You're a bachelor. And so you are filthy. You don't wash dishes. You eat leftover french fries that fell between the couch. Your dog does his stuff all over the house. You got your clothes everywhere. The way you iron your clothes is you put it over the couch at night and <laughs> spread it out and go sleep, hoping in the morning the thing is really nice and ironed for you. And that's what you wear. It is a filthy place, but you like it that way because you live there alone. And even though you got a whole pile of stuff here, you know where that paper is because that is an organized catastrophe. <laughs> okay, so you're happy, all right? You're all by yourself, you're happy. Now, you, all of a sudden, you get a roommate that's super clean. <laughs> or you get married and your wife is obsessed with cleanliness. Now, when she moves in and you say, I do, and you move in, or if you're a college kid, you get a roommate, and he is, is a, a clean freak, what are you going to have? Trouble. trouble. <laughs> you're going to have trouble. Now watch this. Before Christ, I lived alone in my house. It was filthy. It stunk, but I liked it. The smell. <laughs> now, I come to New Hope and I get saved and guess who moves into my heart? The Holy Ghost. He don't like the smell. He don't like catastrophes. So he starts cleaning up and now what happens in my life? I have trouble. Because I have to make decision after decision and choice after choice again and again. Because it is not that you are just saved once. You are being saved. You received Christ and now begins the process of you getting saved. That takes every day for the rest of your life. You're still getting saved. How many of you still getting saved? Raise your hand. Yeah. Turn with me to the book of Acts chapter 3. Just go back a couple of chapters here. Acts chapter 3. Uh, right before Acts 2, 47. It says, now when things were happening and the Holy Spirit began to move, look at the very last verse. They were praising God, having favor with all the people, and the Lord was adding to their number day by day, what? Those who were being saved. Yeah, it's actually, if your translation says those who were saved, is an incorrect translation. Trade that Bible in. Uh, there's a Bible fair coming, right, Pastor Rod? All right, we give you trade-ins, just like used cars. But it should say, God was adding to their number those who were what? Being saved. Being saved. You see, there, I know people that are saved, but I, I know people that are being saved. Oh, it is so refreshing. They'll come up to me and say, I was just, I was just talking to Jesus this morning, and he was talking to me about my family. And it's like, wow. These people stay current with the Holy Spirit. See, others are, I got saved in 1989. <laughs> I haven't moved since. <laughs> and they're just old codgers. They're opinionated and weird. There are weird Christians, right? <laughs> Don't look to the person on your left. <laughs> I saw some of you look like that. No, Don't do it. But there are weird Christians. But the most vibrant, exciting, fresh Christians are those who are still being saved. being saved. 
So the Holy Spirit comes in. Now he's straightening us out. I realized that with New Hope. After we started the first Easter, which was seven months after we got uh, started here in September, about seven, eight months later, Easter happened. We had 1,500 already within about seven months. And we grew 1,000 every year for the next 10 years. So God added to that number very quickly. And you know what happened? The result was trouble. You got it. We had parking troubles, roof troubles, <laughs> atheist troubles, space troubles, people troubles, all kinds of troubles. And I thought, Lord, I, don't, I didn't sign up for this. But you see, when the Spirit of God is on the move, the first result will be, do not let your hearts be discouraged. Believe in God, Jesus said, believe also in me. For in the world you shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. And you have to say, yes, that world is in me. I will overcome that. But that's going to mean trouble. Yes, so which one do you choose? The world or me? Uh, you. Then do it every day. That's why Paul the Apostle says, I die daily. Understand? It's going to happen to, to you tonight, tomorrow. You're going to have a choice. You're going to struggle with something. There'll be a sexual temptation. There'll be a, a word of anger, uh, sabotaging somebody. You just got to stop say, er, Stop. No, I choose Jesus. I choose Jesus. But if you don't know the word, when you say, I choose Jesus, you'll choose a different Jesus than is the real Jesus. Because some people say, well, I choose Jesus. That means, you know, I just kind of like, I love everybody. Well, you don't understand biblical love. Well, you know, God just loves everybody. So, yes, he does. But he died for their sin that is the greatest love of all but you see if we don't know the bible you'll make decisions thinking it's jesus and it's like not the jesus of the word so that's why it's so incredibly important for us to know the word well there were all kinds of problems happening and the leader said, you know, it's not desirable for us to neglect the word of God and prayer in order to serve tables. So they brought, they had a meeting and said, let's choose from among ourselves seven men of what were those three qualifications? Good reputation, full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom, whom we may put in charge of the task. And it found approval, the statement found approval with the whole congregation. And they chose for themselves these men. And God used them in great ways. In this next season, I want to introduce to you, quote, these seven men. And I want you to see them, and I'm going to bring them up here. And these are the people that are going to be, if I'm writing or teaching or training or whatever, these are the people that I want you to know very well that will shepherd well the church. And I want you to know who they are and that they are going to do their utmost best to serve you, just like Acts chapter 6 said. These are men of good reputation, full of the Holy Ghost and of wisdom that we will put in charge of these tasks. And over this next season, I'm going to do my best to stay with teaching and preaching and prayer and writing and training leaders for the future of New Hope. But I'm not going to be managing ministry much anymore. So if you don't see me much during the week, it's not because I'm trying to abandon or leave the church. I'm trying to figure out how can we be an Acts kind of church that this be again Bible times that I don't fry again. And I don't need to because we have men and women full of the Holy Ghost, of good reputation and full of wisdom whom you may put in charge of the task. And the result, the word of God kept increasing and the number of disciples continued to grow. That's what we want. If we don't do this, that won't happen. Now, it is just a, an honest thing when a church grows, 
the leader wants to help and get everything going because of, of his love. And when that happened, we did that for a long time. And then I fried when I was 52. It took me five to seven years to get out of that. And so now... At soon to be 61, we, I thought, you know, let's try it the Bible way this time. <laughs> and so I want to, um, could we, these guys come up? Uh, there's uh, four, let's see, who else? Justin and Rod. So, okay. So, Rod, would you, Justin, John, Ken, and Richard, give these guys a hand as they come up. Would you come right on up here? Uh, one of them is missing, and that is uh, Tim Savage. But let me introduce these to you. There's six of them, and uh, uh, Richard Waialeale. Well, let's start with Justin. Justin here is our evangelism director, so he will be overseeing uh, things of the weekend services, the midweeks, uh, anything that has to do with evangelism, outreach to win people to Christ, and so uh, anything that has to do with that. This is the person. Now, remember the three qualifications, what were they? Good reputation, full of the Holy Spirit, and yeah. So I don't know if they have all of those in <laughs> each. That's why I brought them up together, because the accumulative total will find those qualifications. So they got to sort of work as a team, you know? But Justin is evangelism, and then... When that person gets saved, there's a follow-up. And Richard Waiale Ali, who has been so faithful, he and his wife Mary, for many, many years, Richard will be overseeing the follow-up, the discipleship, care groups, small groups, counseling, anything like that. Richard will be shepherding this church well. Now, I'm going to oversee these people here and then continue to teach and preach and pray and lead strategically and, and look for growth tips in the ministry and write, etc. But these will be directly accountable to me, but these are all shepherds. So I want you to access these people. Anything with follow-up or anything that has to do with small groups or learn at New Hope, Richard. And then over here is Pastor Rod. Pastor Rod will be overseeing the equipping, which is anything of the volunteer leaders of our church. Any volunteer leader comes under Pastor Rod and anything that trains people to lead, lead, not just absorb, but lead. Remember, there's the two ministries of the Holy Spirit. Number one is to reveal Jesus to the believer. Number two, to reveal Jesus through the believer. You got that? So here, revealing Jesus to the believer when they come to Christ. And then reveal Jesus through the believer over here in the equipping. Rod also has the hat of like, a, uh, a, if it's in a corporate parlance, he'd be like a chief ministries officer. He oversees the ministries of the church. So anything that has to do with that, or if you don't like it, blame him right here. Okay. <laughs> Not me. It's him. All right. And then... Our newest staff person is Ken Silva. Would you welcome him? <laughs> Ken Silva, some of you know, was the Honolulu uh, fire chief for how many, for seven years? And so you've been with the fire department how long? 31 years with the fire department. Isn't that amazing? I didn't even know he was that old. He looks young. <laughs> And I said to Ken, Ken, you know, you've been putting out fires for so long, you're perfect for staff. Come on. <laughs> so Ken is going to be, over, he's going to be the, like the COO or the chief operations officer of New Hope while overseeing the extension part, which is uh, marketplace leadership and uh, operations and anything that takes this church out of this church and gets us out into the, to the uh, marketplace and the operations here. So anything to do with operations or extension, Ken Silva uh, will be that person. John is like the CFO, so anything that has to do with finances, he is going to oversee and control, and uh, he uses that to serve the purposes of this church. That's with the mission and does it with our core values. And because he is part pocket, it's a perfect place for him. <laughs> 
he is so cheap, I tell you. No, brilliant, brilliant multitasker. I've worked with a lot of people that are multitaskers. John is at the top of my list. Very, very brilliant man. And I'm so glad that after Tihati for 20, 29 years, uh, the Lord used Tihati to train him and then brought him here to New Hope. So we are very, very thankful. And then there's Tim Savage. As you know, he had his own film company. He was a film, film director, still is, and he's overseeing our multimedia and, and all of that. So anything that has to do with that, Tim will be overseeing that. Those would be six men, and uh, these will be the shepherds that uh, you'll access, so please get to know them. And these are men full of the Holy Ghost, good reputation, and of wisdom, whom we will put in charge of the task. Therefore, the Word of God will continue to grow and increase, and the number of disciples will continue to blossom. Just say thank you again to these guys. So stay up here for a second. And that's what we're going to be doing over in this next era to make, again, the Bible preeminent, to understand the lay of the land, what's going on with this, the whole bill and, and where, where, what our stance is. Remember those four things. But we want to make sure that we are bringing up new leaders, which means we need new leaders to ra be raised up so that we can see the miracles of God, the power of the Holy Spirit, and the increase of salvations because we say, Lord, if we're going to model our church after anything in these days, it has to be the book of Acts because we want to live in Bible times. Can you say amen to that? Amen. So here's, here's how I'd like us to finish. The scripture says, after laying hands on them, they sent them out and the word of God kept increasing. So what we want to do is do exactly what the scripture says. We're going to stand and I'm going to lay hands on them and let's pray for them. Would you stand with me? And remember, it says, and this statement found approval with the whole congregation. Do you approve of this team? Say amen. amen. Good. So we're going to conclude, but as we do, let's pray. Would you extend a hand this way? Heavenly Father, we lay hands on these brothers and we pray for them and commission them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. That even this has found approval with the whole congregation. We ask that these would indeed be men of good reputation, full of the Holy Spirit and of wisdom. That they will be in charge of the tasks of the ministry at hand. And that you will, through them, bring miracles, healing, wholeness, and the advance of the kingdom of God. We will not forget who we are. But we honor these men, and in doing so, we honor you. We want to be a church of the book of Acts. And we want to be living in Bible times. We thank you for this. And now, Lord... Would you anoint this congregation? I extend my hands over this church and I bless them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. That we will never forget who we are and that we'll be a people who bear the truth. Realizing that that will not always bring amicable responses. It will not always be pleasant to people. But we know who we are and in whom we have believed, and we are persuaded that he will keep that which we have entrusted to him against that day. So we're grateful for you, O oh God. Thank you for allowing us to be a people upon whom the presence of God resides. In Jesus' name we pray, and we say, Amen. Amen. Let him know you love him again.